begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Transform. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest uh, who is covering a really, really fascinating topic, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. James Shulman is someone that I have known for years and years. Uh, I have known him in his career working uh, on the Art Store Project. Uh, he was a founding president and a very, very active leader in that, in that groundbreaking work. And also, for a time, I worked with the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education, and we worked with Ithaca, which was part, which helped coordinate activity with ArtStore. So we were, we were colleagues uh, of a kind. Uh, I've always admired his work, and now what I'm bringing him on here to discuss is his new book, which I cannot recommend highly enough, The Synthetic University. You can find a little link to it in the bottom left corner of the screen. There's a little tan color button. And this describes an unusual kind of organization that I think can have so much benefit to really help uh, higher education in ways that we don't really appreciate or talk enough about, but it's also a field for research to try to understand how to make these how to make these projects work and succeed. There is, I think, no better person to talk about this than uh, James Shulman, who is now with the Association of Learned Societies. Let me stop talking about him and actually bring him up on stage. Good morning, James. Hi, Brian, how are you? Oh, I'm great, now that I see you. Uh, and are you also in California today? Yeah, I'm at uh, on the campus of uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley. So it's beautiful here, as it tends to be. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, always disconcerting for me to set foot in California after being away for a while and to realize that they don't have seasons here and that all the lack of seasons are lovely. It's, uh, it's quite a shock. Um, James, there's, there's so much to talk about. And I want to begin by asking you to introduce yourself. And as I mentioned on the forum, we have an unusual way of of academics introducing themselves, which is by what they're working on in the next year. Uh, so I'm curious, what what topics, what projects, what ideas are top of mind for you as you look out into 2024? Great. Well, I'm uh, I'm at the American Council of Learned Societies, which uh, before I started here five years ago, I knew two things. I knew we did something with the societies, and we gave a bunch of fellowships, and those were all good things. And what uh, what I'm really excited about, and some of my colleagues are here, and my, my colleague Joy, our president, um, we're working on a bunch of things that take advantage of this unusual place of being in the middle of things. We're in the middle of a lot of different flows. We have 80 scholarly societies that we work closely with in the humanities and social sciences. We have funders that we work with. We have about 43 deans of humanities that we meet with regularly. The fellowship programs bring in you know, uh, readers and panelists and applicants of all kinds, and they're all varied. So, you know, when you're looking at complicated things like how to sustain the humanities, being in the middle of all those flows, you know, that's what you need because it's not a, you know, one, just tweak one little thing to keep everything working kind of uh, situation. Mm -hmm. What are the, uh, it's a fascinating organization, and I'm glad to see uh, Joy Connolly here from ACLS. What, um, what are the big uh, topics that you're thinking about? Uh, are you looking at, say, trying to reverse the crisis in the humanities? Are you looking at open access publication? Are you uh, looking at the political threats against higher education? What's, uh, what, what's on your radar? So we, a, a few things that I would just highlight, and as you say, all of these things, I mean, the, the, the political situation and the state laws that PEN America and ACE have been such leaders in helping us all work on, I know some of you, they've been on your, uh, in the forum. Uh, you know, those, it's amazing those lands smack dab in the humanities. I mean, whose history gets studied, whose history can't be talked about, uh, whose identity is, is not something uh, that some of these laws want us to be able to study. So so that's a really, it's amazing that's that the humanities are actually going to be front and center of the 2024 presidential race, but they really are. A um, couple of things we have going, um, we are doing, uh, we have two great projects in open access monographs. So the journal world is big and complicated and huge business, but you know, the book world is not so huge, right? There are 4,000 humanities monographs published a year. And so tweaking the money that's in the system, instead of that money just going to buy the book for 200 libraries, we have a great project with the uh, university presses and JSTOR on the subscribed open model. 
We have some funding from Arcadia for an open access prize to, you know, remind people that this is okay. It doesn't hurt. It actually can help. So, so uh, a lot of fun things. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, that's great to see. And I, I'm just so excited to see you bring your talents to bear um, on this, on this great organization. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the, the, the synthetic university and a kind of organization that I think I might need to, uh, let, let me just introduce a little bit, James, and then I want you to cut loose on this. Um, I mean, in your book, you talk about groups like the National Student Clearinghouse. You talk about Investure, which is a multi-campus or trans-campus uh, endowment group. You talk about Art Store, of course. Uh, you talk about Switchboard, which was a career outfit that came out of Reed College. Uh, you talk about the great virtual classics program, Synoikesis, as well as, uh, ac <laughs> sorry, Academium. Um, and you describe this in a really clear way, um, a type of organization that lives outside any one college and provides realistic and mission aligned solutions to collective institutional challenges. These synthetic service providers are one part of the underdeveloped inter-institutional infrastructure that colleges and universities need for the cross-pollination of good ideas and the evolution of trans-institutional norms. Uh, how am I doing so far? Have I, have I pinned these down? So I, I think it's I think you've you've been it down and those examples are you know very vivid and I'd love to talk about them. I think the main thing that I'd emphasize is that um, you know autonomy is not only prized by scholars, by departments, and by institutions. It's really what's made you know U.S. higher education the envy of the world for a hundred years. Uh, and so this the 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 real challenge in working collectively is is when autonomy sort of makes room for some collective action. And, you know, this is not like we should all be teaching the same class or we should all be using the same system. And that's, you know, that that's really the danger, I think, of what happens when the cost problem in higher education gets extreme is people just say, let's shut this down. Let's do the, you know, the queen sacrifice and let's, you know, let's just get one system that fits all because that's all we can afford. And so really what this is a call for are the complicated inter-institutional systems and providers and approaches that can uh, you know, still keep us doing our mission and still respect institutional and individual autonomy, but do you know, make some room for collective action. Which is so, it's so, so difficult. I mean, your whole book wrestles with this question. How do you get multiple academics from multiple institutions coordinated? You begin with that, uh, incredibly powerful uh, legal ruling against uh, MIT as well as other uh, colleges and universities, which really put the kibosh on one form of uh, cooperation. Uh, you have story after story about the difficulties of interinstitutional competition. You have this great, this great anecdote from uh, my friend Kenny Morell uh, from Sinoikesis, where uh, he asks a group of presidents, "What do you prefer to do? Collaborate or compete?" And it's clear that compete is the answer, but they, they can't quite come out and, and say that directly. Um, I, I'm, bef before we get further in that, let, let me ask, what, what other institutions or organizations might count for this kind of group? Uh, would uh, you, you describe an open source alternative for image manip uh, manipulation and hosting at one point? Uh, you touch on publishers as well as interinstitutional uh, teaching projects. Uh, do all those count as well? Are there other examples of synthetic organizations? So here's how I'd think about that, Brian. Like every campus does some very similar things, right? And some of those are going to be particularly, let's take uh, um, campus safety, right? I mean, there's there, there's not going to be one office of campus safety for 3,500 campuses, right? I mean, that would, that would be crazy. It's very local. It's very specific uh, to a campus. On the other hand, it would be crazy if, uh, you know, each campus had to invent its own, you know, handcuffs or its own right. walking system. So right. there are clearly places in everything we do where there's some room for, for common, you know, common answers and collective solutions. And so, and I think what's happening, I mean, and some people in the audience know more about this than I do, but public-private partnerships are growing. They're, you know, they start with things like Aramark for dining services or uh, bring in real estate investment firms to help build dorms or buildings. And there's a lot of good in all of that, right? But I think 
the idea of everything being sort of created as a public-private partnership, including academic things, um, mm -hmm. is you know it has a lot of risks with it. And so the the mm -hmm. mode that I'm talking about has some of the elements of public-private partnership, but it has a lot more emphasis on the partnership than on the sort of co-investor vendor mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. What are what are some of those risks of a public-private partnership? Well, I mean, so the, the classic example would be uh, consultants, right? Management consultants who I, I'm not, I've been a management consultant. I have friends who are management consultants. I believe in consulting. But, you know, the first thing any manager consultant say is, you know, they'll come in when they pitch something and say, you know, we don't have a template. We work with you on what you do. But they have templates, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. There's value in that. There's efficiency and effects. But if... If there are consultants who work with campuses and have very very similar problems over and over again, if they were charging less because of that efficiency of having worked out solutions, that would be one thing. The you know the pressure on for-profit firms, and that's you know that's fine, that's good, that's what the market is really good at, is to come up with solutions with. Uh, higher and higher margins, right? And so that means if you come up with an efficient solution, you don't lower your margins. And so, so a lot of the organizations that you missed it, mentioned at the beginning have real partnerships in the way that there's benefits, there are two-way streets to the partnership, and it's not all about you know how how much can we, how many times can we reuse the model and charge the same every time. Well, the National Student Clearinghouse is a great example of that. Uh, really, to good two-way partnership. Um, so yeah. is so is Art Store. Um, friends, well, I, I, I want to stop asking questions and let you ask questions. Uh, please, please, James, go, go ahead. Say a bit more. I, I didn't. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, people know the National Student Clearinghouse now because, um, but uh, it, uh, when I was at Mellon in the 90s, we were working on projects gathering student data uh, for the research that Bill Bowen and a couple of us were doing at Mellon. And the, the Clearinghouse was just starting. And it's an amazing organization, but it didn't set out to do what it does now. If they had gone into uh, 3,000 registrar's offices in 1994 and said, hey, we want to build this thing called Degree Verify, where we poke our noses into all of your student records so that employers can know whether somebody got a degree or not, they would have been chased out, you know, you know, in screaming fits. They actually went to solve a problem that everyone had, which was, you know, in 1994, Sally May didn't know. If somebody who left the University of Michigan was now uh, employed or now um, a student at the University of Wisconsin. So everybody had to pour over these rolls of these huge yeah. printouts continually. And so what they did was to set out to solve a problem that was a problem for the registrar's office, problem for the students and a problem for the lending agency. And then when you build something like that, that's actually needed, then from there you can do other things. Uh, that's a great example. Uh, your, your book is full of stories of organizations that change and mutate over time um, as they encounter different needs and, and, and different issues. Um, let me uh, bring up, uh, we have questions that are coming in. Again, friends, if you're new to the forum, just go on that white strip on the bottom of the screen and either click the raised hand if you want to join us face to face or click the question mark if you want to type in a question. Like this one here from our good friend, Phil Katz. How would you describe the strength of learned societies today and their role as synthetics? It seems to me they are weaker and less central to shared academic life than they used to be. So uh, thanks, Phil. It's a great question. The, um, the the executive director Jim Grossman of the American Historical Association, you know, reminds us all the time that they don't hire people, right? They don't hire people. They don't make jobs. They don't determine how many tenure track jobs there are going to be. They don't. But what they can do is they can convene, and they can legitimate. Um, and uh, there's a third thing I forget. I'll have to maybe Jim's on here. But anyway, but so, you know, these are incredibly valuable uh, strata of higher education. There are so few things that reach across. And, and the, the, the learning societies have, um, they reach across in their membership, they reach across in their councils of department chairs, as all you know. I mean, so much of the action uh, around, uh, ref, you know, changes in reward structures or in hearing and curriculum are at the departmental level. And so having those councils of chairs incredibly valuable for cross-pollinating good ideas. Now, that said, you're, you're right in the sense that they're struggling because research funding is diminishing. So money to sponsor people going to conferences, money for um, that recognizes release time for people who are an editor or a president of an academic society, that's drying up. 
And so, but we all lose if we don't have those cross pollinating um, platforms. And so I think, you know, they're, they're so important. They really are, I mean, as we all know, I mean, the basis of academic freedom in this country is that the experts themselves um, define what's legitimate in the field, not the politicians, right? And yet those norm setting communities really are, you know, overlap highly with the academic societies. And so that, that, that capacity to judge what is legitimate work is so important. Mm. Uh, well, that's thank you, James. That's a great answer. Uh, Phil, uh, thank you for the good question. This is an example of a text question, by the way, um, if you're new to this. Um, and I just want to say it's chapter uh, five or chapter six that's about possibilities of intercampus teaching. And James has a bunch to say about uh, scholarly societies there. We have uh, another question that's come up, uh, and this is from our good friend up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, John Hollenbeck. And John asks this. I see the problem starting with course credit being accepted at all campuses. This sunk our small attempt in New Mexico to offer high level classes to multiple campuses. How do you propose getting camp? And then he gets cut off. Um, uh, I, I, I think that, but I think you can see where he was going with that. Um, what, yeah. uh, you know, how does, how does that play a role here? Well, it's a great topic because it also highlights the tension between autonomy and, uh, and collective action, right? I mean, what should my, you know, uh, intro to economics class at this institution count as an intro to economics class at some other institutions? I feel like that progress, some progress has been made with this, with the renewed attention over the last decade on community college transfer. It's one of the great things that's come out of the student success movement is the realizing, you know, realization that articulation of course credits is, you know, has been such a horrible, you know, disadvantage for students and for for society that invests in in education and in these students and needs people to get through the system. So the work of Lumina and people like that on on mm -hmm. bringing that and the work of individual campuses that have formed partnerships where students go in and they can do things in advance, knowing what courses are going to transfer and what aren't. I mean that that kind of sort of. I hate to use all the military metaphors, but that hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat of, of schools working together and then intermediaries like, you know, the college board. I mean, they had to deal with it with AP credits and, um, you know, credential engines started by Lumina and things like this that are working on how to make sure that that wastage doesn't happen. But, you know, the, but everyone's got to play like all those people who want to cross their arms and say, no, 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 my course isn't like that other course. You know, right. you have to realize that we're actually all in this together. Uh, uh, John in the in the chat continued, and he said, "It's a, it's such a boring seeming problem, but campuses only seem to trust their own faculty." Um, which, yeah, I guess one one of my theories of change is that everybody's got to be involved, right? And so, and it, and we got to be working on all fronts simultaneously. So yes, you have to be working within the norms of the institution and the, the vertical institution that you're part of, but you have to be working horizontally and diagonally because, I mean, change is so hard and we're all so busy and there, you know, it all can just stop because something else comes up, right? Well, that's a that's a great answer. And uh, again, um, as always, John, thank you for the really, really good question. Uh, friends, we have uh, the, the uh, Q&A box stands open for you. And of course, as you can tell, James here is proof that you don't have to have a beard to be on the stage. Um, so you can uh, you can join us at any time. Just click the raised hand button and we'd be glad to, uh, to host you on the stage. I have, uh, I'm afraid, a broader question. And that's that's one of the major themes of, of the book, which is that uh, a lot of these synthetic organizations try to improve the operations and the experience of academia, but also they're trying to grapple with cost containment. And you have this great, great line. Um, I can't pull it up right now, but it was that campuses have no internal constituency devoted to cost reduction or cost containment. Um, and the, the second, or sorry, the last two chapters of your book, you you, you do this blindingly great work where you're really blazing a trail trying to figure out how to establish a, a ecosystem that can help campuses do this. But, but I'm struck by this. I mean, how, it, it, it seems like a, an intractable problem. If, if campuses don't have any intrinsic reason to want to reduce tuition, reduce free, uh, reduce fees, reduce costs, 
how how can you create such an ecosystem and have it be accepted within this academic ecosystem that you've talked about? So sadly, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better, and things are getting worse in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. the you know yeah. the, the the cost of higher education. I mean, as people in this forum know, that there's a difference between cost and price, but the cost of doing all the things that we're doing and all the things that we're expected to do, right? To prepare people to be hedge fund managers and to be documentary filmmakers and to be nurses and to be, you know, to be engineers. I mean, all the careers, all the uh, unfunded mandates, all the regulatory responsibilities, the big time sports and the big time arts. I mean, there's so many demands made on university colleges and universities, and there's so many creative people, faculty, staff, administrators, coming up with ways of fulfilling those many needs, right? So there's all. So we know that the the the, the cost. It's not. There's no. It's not wasted money. It's that a lot of money is being spent on a lot of things, but. You know, Bill Bowen, my mentor and, and friend, um, you know, wrote in 1968 that the cost of higher education is going to increase faster than the cost of uh, inflation at large because it's a labor intensive industry. He knew then and people have known said then exactly where this is all going. And the and he said then, you know, he said you don't have to be Cassandra to know that it's not going to go well. Right. So. So, it, it, you know, we, we there are things we can do. And as long as state subsidies for public education were helping to cement all that, it was sort of, and as long as housing prices and housing values were going up forever, and, and as long as interest rates were zero, effectively zero for 10 years, um, yeah. we could have a lot of things to cover that up and to pay for those costs. Well, that's not lasting, right? And so we need to we need to figure this out. And as you say, Brian, when you talked about that, that example with Kenny Morrell and the presidents, presidents are hired and rewarded based on making your campus distinctive. So and and department chairs and deans, they have incentives to do things that are not about collaborative action, right? And so that we have to tinker with. Uh, we have uh, the, the chat box has been having a, a lot of really good conversation, as, as we often do. Uh, and uh, one of them comes again from uh, from uh, Phil Katz, who follows up and asks this. Are faculty and staff even trained to understand that those challenges to cost containment are an essential aspect of higher education? You know, it's a really interesting question. And you started, by, Brian, by asking what we're doing at ACLS. I mean, one of the one of the things that Joy and I talk about often, and with deans and with uh, graduate school deans and department chairs, is that it's amazing how little people learn about the enterprise of higher education as they're trained to work in it. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, does this mean that everybody should do a tour of duty in the deputy provost office? Maybe. Right? I mean, but. But understanding, I mean, there's always a perception that there's tons of money out there that's not being shared with them. And understanding what makes this system work. It'll make people good department chairs. It'll make people good administrators. It'll make it'll make faculty, graduate students who become faculty, uh, you know, able to be part of the system so that when they want to change things, if they want to change reward structures, if they want to change the, you know, the, the, the place of, uh, of, of, of part-time visiting faculty and, and you know, non-tenure track faculty and the disp you know, discrepancies and disparities there, you have to understand how the place works. So I think it would be great if, if that were part of what people learned. Well, I, I think that's excellent. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I hate to get personal on this, but I can say I went to the University of Michigan and we learned uh, very little. I learned more about how universities operate by actually being active in the TA union and, uh, and leading a, a helping be part of a job action, uh, which was a great learning experience. I would, have, you know, in retrospect, I would love to have spent some time in the provost office and the CBO's office. Uh, this is a uh, excellent, excellent question, Phil. Uh, really, really important point. Um, thank you, James, for for clarifying that. Um, our good friend uh, uh, Lisa Durf has a, a question about this point of collective action. She asks, from a business viewpoint alone, won't all these individual institutions have to team together to just to survive? So um, it's very hard for institutions not to survive. Um, it's very easy for them to be in trouble. It's very easy for them to change things that they thought were part of their mission in order to respond to market forces. 
Um, and yes, over the last decade, more and more are going out of business, but it's very hard for uh, nonprofit institutions to, to go. There's a lot of people who care about them. There's always some alums who care about them or a state's attorney general. So, um, and I guess the other, so, so they, they're, they're not very good at dying. They're very good at bleeding. And there's a lot of wastage in, in, in the meanwhile. And I think the other part of Lisa's question though is, won't they have to collaborate? I'm not a huge believer in collaboration. I, 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 huh. I, I love it. I believe in it personally. I like to collaborate, but um, you know the idea that institutions who 99% of their time are competing with each other for everything, for students, for faculty, for grants, for public attention, um, yeah. are going to then collaborate freely and happily in ways that you know that work really well. I mean, it happens in places. Interlibrary loan is terrific. There's something in it for everybody. So yeah. there are definitely places where collaboration works. But for the most part, they're competing. So so the particular aspect of this book, which is you know maybe splitting here, but it's about a set of organizations that actually can bring about change by forcing it from the outside. So mm. you know you heard a little bit about Art Store, this organization that my colleagues and I built for 15 years so that every college didn't, you know, scan their crap well, slide from Lisa over and over again, right? You know, and catalog it and have the general counsel decide whether they could even use that digital image and all that. So, so one of the things that was that I learned in doing that was, you know, we had to make sense to the architectural historians and to the libraries and all the academic computing. We had to make sense to the people who we had to convince that this was a good answer in complement to their own local work, right? But the other thing is, it wasn't just like mission. It wasn't just, hey, we're good guys and you're good guys, and we're all thinking the same thing. It was also, we had to be good enough that they would write a check. If they didn't write a check, A, we wouldn't survive, but B, it wouldn't show that they really cared. If they're like, sure, give us art store, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing. If they write a check, so that, so that outside sort of mixture of material and symbolic buy-in is, mm -hmm. is can bring about change in a way that I don't think collaboration really can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, that's that's a fine distinction, but a, a very very useful one. Um, this makes yeah. Would you consider JSTOR to be one of these organizations? So JSTOR is you know as we all know an amazing organization and a platform for doing so many things now that I admire so much. I, I the the little distinction that I would make is that when Bill and Kevin started JSTOR in 1993, 1994, campuses weren't about to scan all their bound journals. They were about to build new wings of the library to store them. But so that was, I mean, that it might have just been that it was so prescient that even DIY campuses hadn't decided to do this themselves. So that was a, a, a collective action that was taken sort of preemptively. Uh, and it, it may well have been three years later, campuses were all going to start doing that. And then it would have been the biggest cost savings in the history of higher education. Well, that's that that's very, very interesting. Um, I, 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 I like I like where that that's a this is you are breaking so much ground in in this research and also, of course, in your career in, in developing uh, one of these organizations and now working at a, at a second one. Um, Friends, again, uh, this is a place for you to ask your questions. I have a ton of them, um, and uh, I, I would I would be happy to uh, share um, share your questions and, and better best of all. Um, Chris Aldrich in the um, in the chat has a great response. James, when you mentioned uh, you know institutions can always bleed, uh, it's harder for them to die. Chris has the surgeon's truism: the bleeding always stops. It's just <laughs> the coldest thing I've heard today. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, well, the, uh, Chris also follows up by asking this in, in, in from the chat. Uh, framed uh, positively and more hopefully, how much more could educational institutions be doing if they weren't spending all their time fighting the bleeding? Yeah, I, I think I think that's really the key to not only why we mm -hmm. need solutions like this, but also how. And what I mean by that is there has to be a, a there has to be a better answer in uh, in it for the faculty or the staff or the administration than it's it, this is more efficient right this is more efficient doesn't work 
It just doesn't. I mean, we're we're mission driven places. We spend money on things that are meant to lose money. And otherwise, we shouldn't be mission driven institutions. Right. I mean, and so so it's very tricky to know when to, you know, so again, so so saying we're going to do this, we're going to use this solution or this shared approach because it's, it's more economically efficient is just it's it's wrong. It, it's not the right way to do this. And, you know, one of the great things about Sinoikis is you talked about Kenny Morell earlier and that effort, which did so much good and got so much right, was mm -hmm. they by work, it was faculty driven. And so, you know, if Kenny does Aristophanes in Greek comedy and Hal Haskell, uh, you know, at Southwestern does uh, Roman architecture, you know, they, they could see by working together, they could teach what they each of them know best. They could cover for each other when somebody goes on sabbatical. You know, the, you know, all, uh, you know, when if you're one or two classicists that um, uh, at at a liberal arts college, even when you have a sabbatical, you can't take it, right? Because you know, who's going to cover your students? Who's going to cover your classes? Who's going to help with senior thesis? So, so the, the 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 idea of that that they came up with was better than just the DIY answer. And it wasn't, you know, just pave, pave it and make it the Walmart of classics, right? It was, it was how to work together to come up with a better solution. So, so to the, to the question, yes, there'd be more time to do things collectively and better if we're not doing absolutely everything uh, ourselves. Mm. Mm. Well, good. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful possibility um, to, to keep in mind. Uh, we have, uh, um, more questions that are, uh, are coming in, uh, in the chat, by the way, uh, Sharon Bailey, uh, talks about other mission driven institutions, which is, um, something that does, uh, does appear in the book. Um, this is, uh, a, a question that we have here from our good friend and the scholar, uh, Stephen Ehrman, who I think is in uh, Maryland today. And we just bring him up on stage or bring his question up on stage. Uh, online learning by many institutions creates opportunities for creating synthetic infrastructure. What examples of such infrastructure have you seen? Help small colleges market courses, for example? Yeah, so so online is part of this. Um, and we all remember the MOOC craze of 2012, where, uh, you know, it was declared that MOOCs were going to, you know, solve the cost problem in higher education and solve everything. Um, that has not happened. And in fact, so I do write about both, um, you know, the, 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 the parts of teaching, shared teaching that MOOCs got right, but there's so many parts to teaching that are so far beyond and so much more complicated than the recording of lectures and the adaptive learning, right? Those are fine things and there they can be a part of uh, good answers, but, you know, what are we going to do about grading? What are we going to do about uh, uh, office hours? What are we going to do about one to one work? I mean, there there's so many pieces of this puzzle, and this is you know going back to the question of the role of societies. I mean, the societies can really help on this uh, by you know by sharing. I mean, as they do, they you know, they're a venue for people to share syllabi. Um, I write about the textbook and how the textbook is actually a synthetic solution. I mean. You know, whether or not people get enough credit for it, you know, for writing a good textbook, as, as I believe they should. But the idea that, every, you know, not, not every campus, you know, brews its own textbook, right, for every class. So we're somehow we've, there are places where we've accepted pieces of the pedagogical enterprise that we could do collectively. And to do some more of that, um, you know, is really interesting. And I owe a great debt to one of the anonymous readers from Princeton Press, uh, who my earlier version of the chapter where I do talk about shared classes, you know, sort of said, I think it's a pretty sad world if like, you know, if it's 100 teachers or 1000 teachers teaching every all, all the courses for the country. And I realized and it, it, how much I was under um, uh, appreciating and under talking through all the complexity of sharing classes. What, what, what the reality is, is there are like 1.3 million teachers in the country in higher education. And yeah. one way or another, in a few years, they're going to be 1.2, right? They're not, we're not, they're not going to be 1.4. And so the question is how we get there, how we do it in ways that make sense, how we do it in ways that keep fields alive and thriving, you know, especially mm -hmm. that aren't market driven. So I mm -hmm. think, 
you know, the, the reality is, um, there, you know, there isn't money falling off of the federal budget or state budget into higher education. So we're going to have to figure out how to make it a little more efficient. Do you? Well, first of all, that, that, that's a fantastic question, Steve. And Steve always does this. And uh, some of you might remember he was a forum guest talking about his really, really excellent uh, new book on the Iron Triangle. So, Stephen, thank you. And James, thank you for that for that great question or that great answer, which brings to mind a question from me, which is um, I, I'm hearing this debated a lot in uh, a, a lot of different academic places, uh, often, I think, from humanities faculty, um, where they believe that the solution to this problem uh, of cost uh, is to basically pump up state and federal support. Um, you know, John Warner from Inside Higher Ed has a whole book on the subject. Siva Vaithan Nathan um, at uh, UVA thinks that this is the clear solution. Uh, Chris Newfield, a wonderful friend of our program, a, a great scholar, has written that he thinks this is what's coming up, that we're about to experience a cultural shift away from privatized uh, thinking towards public-oriented thinking. Um, but you're, you're pretty skeptical about this, both in person and in, in the book. Do you, do you think, is there any chance that we could uh, increase public funding and public support for higher ed? Still, I, I, I don't know enough about, uh, about real politics uh, to say whether, how viable it is. I, I can first say that I would totally welcome it. I mean, I, I think it's much needed, much deserved, and it would be wonderful. I don't, you know, we just saw what happened with uh, trying to make community college free. Uh, yeah. For students, I mean, I, I don't I don't see huge subsidies rolling out in any direction. Now that said, there are things we can do. And so when when I look at the West Virginia situation, I mean, I can see lots of things that I wish had gone differently uh, with the administration, um, you know, and the state and the building of buildings and their enrollment projections and all kinds of things. Um, on the other hand, I think we also, we in the humanities and we in academia, you know, continually need to make a case for support. We need to show that we're valuable. You know, Ron Daniels' book about what universities is owed democracy, it doesn't mean everything should be applied. It doesn't mean that all research should be immediately useful. I'm a huge believer in basic research and the pluralism of what kind of scholarship we should have. But that said, when there's public interest among scholars and among students, doing work and having it rewarded that is publicly engaged or publicly accessible that's a good thing you know the, the world will care more about the academy if they understand what we do we got to keep doing that we can't give up um but by, by the way james just because I, i'm going to keep singing your praises there's um in the chat there is a quick discussion about college sports and i just want to say as i say to everybody um the book that james co-authored with bill bowen uh, the Game of Life is, for me, just one of the great books of higher education ever. And that's that classic groundbreaking book about uh, college sports using actual data. Um, and I, I can't recommend it highly enough. So if you haven't read it, grab a copy right now. Um, we have more questions coming in, James. Uh, and one of them comes from uh, our friend, uh, Mark Corbett Wilson. And he asks, where the students fit into all this? Uh, we've been talking about external stakeholders, we've been talking about faculty and staff, but where do students fit into the synthetic organization ecosystem? Yeah, it's really interesting because the students amazingly have so little voice in all of this, right? I mean, it's wild. I mean, they're the ones who are writing, they and their family, they're writing bigger and bigger checks, right? And 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 they're not happy about that. And so put aside, you know, the the hyper-selective places where, you know, they could fill their classes 10 times over with full pay students who would pay more than the, than the sticker price, right? I mean, there's, there's so much competition to get in. But within the rest of the system, one would think that there'd be more pressure from students and families about the cost problem. I don't think they know where, how to work on it. Like, so divesting from fossil fuels, they know how to work on, right? They know that there's an investment committee and they know that there are managers and there are ESG managers and there are managers who, you know, can, can deploy their money in ways that are more environmentally, you know, thoughtful and respectful. So they, they that's a problem they know how to work on. The cost problem, they're basically told, this is what you've got, right? And so they need to find, I mean, student, we need to, we need to find, it's not on them, we all need to find a way for the student voice 
and the student voting with your feet to be a little more effective that this is not okay. And yet we get sucked, students, family, faculty, administrators get sucked into the rankings, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, yeah, that, that incident with Kenny Morrell and the presidents is so important because basically what he was saying is, hey, look, we've got this great collaborative effort here. Does this, does this make you all look good? And their answer is no. Their answer is, I'm supposed to be able to brag that I have the best classics department, you know, in in Mississippi, or the best classics department among liberal arts colleges with an enrollment of this, or I have the best classics department, or we move from having the fourth best classics department to the second. And so I think what we need to do is give students a way of sort of saying, here's what we need, right? We need a good education that's not just career preparation, certainly career preparation. We need the things that we we're, we want, you know, that the market isn't going to protect for us. But we also just can't let the cost run up forever, you know, endlessly. So, but but that's on us to figure out how to have enough solutions that they can find their place in. Well, that's a really wide ranging answer, James. Thank you. Thank you. I, I've got a blog series, by the way, where I'm tracking which university will be the first to crack six digits for annual fees. Um, so I think it's about two years out, um, and that, that may be, they may pull back from the brink, the symbolic brink, but, um, not for uh, long. Think, yeah, now the pressure is too great. Mark, thank you for the vital question. Um, and we have one uh, question from, uh, our good friend, Tom Ames coming to us from the Houston, Texas area. And, uh, Tom asks, do our academic decision-making mechanisms have enough flexibility to create evolutionary change? What do we change about that? Will it take a hard crisis? Um, so everyone should go read uh, 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 Brian's book. Uh, 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 Brian from McAllister, last name. Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Brian Rosenberg. So Brian has a wonderful book that is out uh, just now. Um, 17 years as president McAllister and talking just about, you know, really candidly about the challenges about um, about change, curricular change, reward structure change, uh, getting faculty to encouraging faculty to think differently. I, you know, I I work with faculty, chairs, deans, uh, you know, every day, and you know, I really don't think that they're the, they're people who are just denying all this. I think they're people. It's a really insidiously constructed system that is so amazingly change resistant, right? I mean, so so I think what has to happen is, um, I think, I mean, and again, back to, to Kenny and, and his colleagues in Greek and Roman studies, um, you know, they saw that the field wasn't going to thrive uh, if, if they just like batten down the hatches and put their head in the sand and said, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. You know, they're, they were going to be placed by, you know, itinerant scholars because they were cheaper and blah, blah, blah. And there were going to be so many. So I, I think, you know, I think in the same way that faculty members, especially in the MAs, have seen that their students, a lot of their students really aren't getting academic jobs. I mean, you know, even at the most elite places, I think that's waking them up to say, hey, you know, maybe some change is needed. Maybe some change in graduate curriculum and graduate admissions is needed, you know, because we're not serving our students well and we can no longer just, you know, cheerfully point to the anecdotal, you know, student who got a tenure track job. We have to realize that, that we need to do some work on this. So it, it's not easy. And, and it's a great question because, it, you know, it people who are in a good place are sort of like, I'm in a good place. I'm just going to ride it out. But they, they don't want to ride it out. They don't want the future of their fields to be diminished by all this. Yeah, yeah. Ah, shoot. Uh, Tom always asks great, great probing questions. And, and James, as always, that's a fantastic answer. Um, we have, uh, friends, we're running out of time. We've got about 11 minutes to go. So if you have more questions and comments, this is uh, this is your time. And if you're um, uh, chatting away in the chat box, let me know if, if any of your ideas have come up to full fruition, become a real question. Or if you want to join us on stage, uh, happy to do that. Um, a question came up from uh, some folks uh, who couldn't make it today. Uh, and one of them is uh, our good friend, uh, Don Shawless. And he asks about 2U and EDX. Now, I, I know you wrote a bit about uh, EDX uh, in your discussion of MOOCs. Um, 
and I'm, I'm curious, what's your assessment? What's your take on, on 2U right now? They're pretty large, but they, they're, they're buying stuff, but they're having problems. What do you think about them as one of your intermediary organizations? So I don't know the people involved. And so I don't, I re, I, I'm about to say something that sounds disparaging and I, I don't really know enough to, you know, paint it with as clear a brush. I will paint as with that brush though, the mode of work that to you and other OPMs are in. And that is um, they're doing something very difficult. I, I write about EAB in the book uh, too, and, and student success, you know, mm -hmm. um, consultant firms. All of these firms are doing something very hard. They're doing something that is capital intensive. So it's not like, uh, I, you know, I mean, I think, and that's, I think, a lot of what edX found out that, you know, to do this, you need to have a really good business model because it's not cheap to do well. I think what happens is when, you know, do you to use a big public company, EAB is a big, I got bought by private equity. So to do a lot of these very difficult things, you need capital and you need shareholders, right? And so uh, when I think about the edX purchase by 2U, it doesn't make me happy, right? I'm now maybe the, the money, the results from that sale will, you know, Harvard and MIT will undoubtedly do good things with it. But a lot of institutions contributed to edX and contributed courses. A lot of faculty members were brought in that this was going to do something that was really, you know, the OPMs, uh, again, I think it's hard. I don't, I'm not saying every college should build its own online platform, yeah. not at all. But you know, but a but a, a public company OPM, uh, you know, is has a lot of incentive to build programs, to do the marketing of programs that uh, may or may not be beneficial for students. And while they might create some, you know, happy spillover money for institutions that they didn't have before, not really sure that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a really, really great nuanced answer. And Don, as, as always, uh, thank you for your questions and thank you for your work on all of this. Um, something has come up in conversation as I was describing the session with a lot of people. Um, this came up by email and Slack and, and so on, which is that two, two topics seem to be uppermost in mind uh, among university leaders, but also among faculty. Uh, I mean, there are a bunch of topics, but two of them really stand out. One of them is DEI and its full complexity, um, but the other is AI. Um, and apparently these have to be abbreviations in order to cite them. But um, I'm, I'm wondering, is, that a, is this an opportunity for synthetic organizations to, um, or have synthetic organizations already appeared, which can help universities and colleges deal with both diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as the you know, gigantic potential of uh, artificial intelligence? So I think the work that's going on right now around defending uh, DEI work, anti-racist work, it shows the, the need for collective work there. Now, it doesn't mean that, again, there shouldn't be a chief uh, you know, DEI officer for higher education uh, across the system. But what it shows, and one of the things that's really powerful about um, what PEN America and ACE and, and some of our member societies are doing working to combat these state laws that are about DEI, but they're also just about intruding on, you know, on, on the autonomy of higher education and on academic freedom. Uh, what it shows is that we don't have collective infrastructure for working on these issues. So we're now in a defensive posture. So everybody, so provosts and presidents and deans and chief diversity officers who are being, you know, suddenly hit with these laws, these state laws and having to change their language and having to change their work, work that we've all invested so much time in moving the economy forward. But we've, you know, we're, we're, we're all working so close to the bone in terms of resources that all we can do is like react. And so I, I have no doubt that there's more things that we could be doing to make the case and to, you know, and to highlight uh, ways that um, you know equity work and and inclusivity has enriched all of our work and our fields and the education of our students, but we are you know again making that case on a school by school basis, uh, and I think there's certainly on a policy ba level uh, you know ways that we could make that case more collectively to the society who votes for these state legislators who then enact these laws. So I guess I mean would. In that arena, would 
lobbyist groups be an example of this? You know, academic lobbyists who are, are fighting in state legislatures for us? Yeah, you know, one of the things, right, it's so funny, you've done this, you've written books, um, and uh, many of the people are, it's only at the end of the book that you realize all the things that you really meant to say and that you should have said and what it means. And one of the things I realized, and I still probably haven't emphasized, emphasized strongly enough in the book, in writing the book, I was writing about a particular mode of mission-driven and market-supported organizations that can bring this kind of change, right? And then yeah. as I got through it, what I realized is they're just part of, like, a desperately needed interinstitutional infrastructure. I mean, I think of things like the University Innovation Alliance, and I think of things about the like the Council on Library and Information Resources, and I think about and I think about what you're doing. I mean, these are things that bring people together across their busy days in their vertical institutions, and that you know some of them are service providers, some of them are norm setting, some of them are collaborative, you know, some of them are cross pollinating things that work. I mean, one of the things I really admire about the UI University Innovation Alliance is you know they're they're like saying what really works. We're not all going to invent these things. There's too much to do here. So I, I think. So when you when you when you ask about policy and you know and uh, uh, lobbyists, I mean we work with a group called the National Humanities Alliance that you know mm -hmm. that does lobbying. It lobbies you know on Capitol Hill and it makes the public case for the humanities. I mean these this is these are really important organizations because otherwise mm -hmm. everyone's left to do everything on their own. Mm -hmm. There's more and more of these. I mean, I, I just I know you have lots of spare time on your hands, James, but um, you, know, you should put up a, a Google Doc. Of a directory of these groups, um, you know, I mean, in in our in our fifty seven minutes of conversation, you've you've really shown us more and more of that. You've you've illuminated a whole stratum of the higher education ecosystem that that works in these fields. Um, well, we the have, things we that have, have, people mad at me from all sides is somebody is bound to reduce this book to saying. This guy hates autonomy, hates academic freedom, thinks we should all buy, you know, our academic courses, you know, off the rack at Staples. Um, and that's not at all who I am. But there, you know, there is also a treacherous middle ground where we all have to, you know, figure out some things we can do together. Uh, indeed, indeed. Well, let me let me ask one wrapping up question. Um, what would what would higher education look like? The world of colleges and universities, at least in the U.S. What would it look like if we really expanded uh, the universe of synthetic organizations? You know, what if we took these more seriously and uh, invested more in them and really grew out that ecosystem? What, what might higher ed look like in, say, five or ten years? I think it would look very much like how it looks now, just a, a little better. You know, just a little better. We're, you know, the, the, this this kind of work. Is not there's not going to be one synthetic service provider that solves all the problems. It's not going to slash the cost of higher education by 25 percent. But if we can slow the rate of cost increases and we can do so while making, you know, while preserving all the things that we care about that the market may not care about, you know, that's that's going to be really good. And, you know, it will make the public case for higher education better and uh, it won't it won't, you know, magically transform the system. But I'm I, I used to, I used to write about Renaissance literature. I used to believe that magic was the key thing, and now I believe in the magic of getting real things done. <sighs> magic getting real things done, and you have done so much, including spending a delightful hour with us. Thank you, thank you so much, James, for for being with us. This has been a terrific conversation. What what's the best way for people to keep up with you? What's the best way to find what you're working on with ACLS? Uh, so I'm I'm posting stuff sporadically on LinkedIn, but uh, our work at ACLS, we have a great director of communications, Heather Mangrum. If you want to get on our uh, our list, she's she she's publicizing the various things we're doing. The people we're working across all all parts of the sector on uh, institutional change. So uh, definitely go to our site and get on our list. And can I make one last plug? Please, everyone should read Brian's book. You know, we uh, on climate because this. You know, we all have to get involved in this, and Brian does a beautiful job. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to refer to Brian Rosenberg, and I was going to say next week we're hosting him on the forum, um, which will be great. But but thank you for saying that. Uh, my publisher thanks you, and you are, of course, completely right. Um, <laughs> please enjoy the rest of your time, your afternoon here in, the, in Berkeley, and thank you again. Please keep up the awesome work, James. Great. Thanks, everyone.
And friends, I just need to wrap up with a couple of quick comments, but one of them is to say thank you all for all these great questions and comments. Uh, this has been a real, real uh, tour through higher education from an unusual angle that I think illuminates a lot of the ecosystem and helps us think about it in really, really productive ways. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this on social media, here's my updated slide. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE wherever you are. Uh, there's my, my handle on Twitter, along with the Shindig events, if you want to at them. There's me on Mastodon, Brian, Brian Alexandi. Uh, you can find me on Threads and on Blue Sky, and of course, uh, on my blog. Uh, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions where we've talked about uh, all kinds of ideas that came up today, from the economics of higher ed to faculty autonomy, please look at our, our uh, whole archive. Just go to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. Uh, if you want to look at our sessions coming up, we have more and more topics the changing landscape of online higher education. And next week, as James said, the resistance to academic change. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again all for uh, being uh, wonderful discussants. It's been a pleasure thinking with you. I hope everybody is well, safe, and sound. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>